Hi everybody, my name is Don Bevenauer and I'm a volunteer guide here at the Yale George Museum of Native American and Western Art. We are located in Indianapolis, Indiana, downtown, close to the State House, and pretty much in the center of everything that is downtown Indianapolis, and we would like to welcome you to the museum. One of the things that we like to tell our guests is that, and we, we want them to know, is that the Native Americans, the West, was and is a collection of diverse peoples, experiences, resources, and landscapes. Our Native American people are still here, but all cultures change over time. They do not exist in isolation. And I'll just go back with a little history of the Isle of Jordan. A uh, little over 33 years ago, the Harrison Isle of Jordan, our founder, had a collection of Native American uh, and Western art in his home. And pretty soon his uh, collection outgrew his resources at home. So Mr. Eidljorg and several of his friends got together and decided to plan a museum. And the results of which you can see around you. We are in the uh, Art of the American West Gallery. There are two galleries on the, on the ground floor here. And uh, the Art of the American West and the Gun Galleries have a good bit of Native American and Western art and sculpture, both uh, three-dimensional and two-dimensional art. And uh, this, is, this is kind of important because it gives our guests a, an idea of, of the art that they are looking at so they can see a, a bronco buster or a rider or an animal in three dimension and the, gives them a sort of a adjunct or a reinforcement of the two dimensional art they see on canvas or, or paper. And that's really important. Mr. Eideldorg is a native of Indianapolis and he his career was in oil and gas development, and uh, he traveled all over the United States and into South America. And uh, the museum, as our culture, is a constant change uh, of exhibi uh, exhibitions and emphasis, and we have adults and kids from all over Indianapolis, all over Indiana, come and visit us to take advantage of this experience. Um, most people think when they think of the American West, they think of the cowboy and the Indian. Uh, the American West uh, and the Southwest were made up of Native Americans, uh, African Americans, uh, Chinese, uh, immigrants from all over the, all over the known world that, have, that came to the West to seek their fortune. And as it's in the American West, all of our visitors are of that extraction as well. They come from all walks of life, all ethnic groups, all religions and, uh, and creeds. And we strive to give them a, an experience that shows the American West and its, and its peoples and artists. Hello everybody, this is Don Biebenauer again. Uh, I'd like to take you through uh, three paintings uh, which happen to be my particular favorites within the museum. And it's hard to have favorites in such an outstanding museum with such a uh, vast variety of, of uh, two and three dimensional art and uh, artifacts. But uh, I'd like to, to talk a little bit about uh, this particular painting. Now, every artist tries to tell a story with his or her artwork. And this painting has a name, but I'm going to kind of leave it up to you to decide what you want to call it, as opposed to me just throwing out a, a name for you. Uh, and then maybe I'll give you the, the real name of the painting, which we probably need to do. Uh, the artist here is Kenneth Miller Adams, and the painting itself is oil on canvas. And uh, Mr. Adams is an American. He uh, died in 1966. And he started out his career as a lithographer, as did many of the artists do. And a lithographer is someone who does 
drawings or etchings and they're published out on a in a magazine or a, or a newspaper and so many of our artists started out that way because that was the way they could they could make money uh, he was born in Topeka Kansas and uh, he uh, was a private in the US Army during World War one and after his service was over he studied in uh, in France and Italy, and he moved into New he moved to New York. Uh, he was a the youngest and last member of the Taos Society of Artists in Taos, New Mexico, before it was disbanded. Uh, Mr. Adams's work uh, hangs uh, in the National Museum of American Art at the Smithsonian. Okay, uh, Mr. Adams was known for his landscapes, and he. Uh, painted pretty much like he he saw it, and uh, one of the things that I like to uh, ask everybody to, when they first see this painting, is to look at it, kind of put yourself in the place of the individuals who are standing here. Uh, what's going on with the man, the woman, and the little one that is tugging on his mother's arm or is his mother tugging on his arm? What's, go what's going on in the painting? What is Mr. Adams trying to tell us as we look at it? And I might just point out a couple of, of, of things for your, for your think of, to, to think about. First of all, the farmer's leaning on a shovel, okay? Now, what kind of what kind of images does that conjure up? Also, he's laying on the shovel, and what is, what is the look on his face? Uh, what's, going, what's going on in his mind? Uh, his wife is kind of walking away from the ditch where the farmer is standing. Looks like the little boy might rather not be out there on a work day with his with his mom and dad, but what do you, what is what are they saying to you? What's what's going on in your mind as you look to this picture? Uh, one of the things that is really striking to me is that the farmer has a pair of rubber boots on. So what do you think is going on with the rubber boots? They're probably in the southwest portion of the United States, maybe New Mexico, Arizona, maybe Southern California, and What's happened? Why would he wear boots in a arid area? So he's in, he's in the boots, he's got his shovel, but look at his face. What's going on in his mind? Is, do you think he's, he's happy about something, sad about something? Is he thinking about something? What's going, what, what, is his, what is his, are his expressions telling you? What is his wife? body language say to you and we kind of can figure out what the kid up's doing he's he done he doesn't really want to be there so you think about that for a minute the ditch that the farmer and his family are standing in what what does a ditch usually do is it an irrigation ditch and is is that what's that's what's going on is that's what's kind of pushing his his uh, his uh, state of mind, the expression on his face. Uh, if you look off to the left, in the background, there's what looks like a, a field of something growing. I always kind of think about maybe it's crops of some kind. Maybe if it's in Southern California, it's pecan trees or, or whatever it is. But do you think that, I always wonder if that's part of it, his uh, his farm and is his farm not doing well and the farm behind him doing well uh, is that his there's a house in the way far in the background is that his house or is that maybe somebody else's place so you kind of wonder you can make up a story as you go along but look at the you take another look around and kind of enveloping all three subjects in the painting it's an old broken down tree which is kind of dead and 
it looks like it's time to reach out, maybe sweep the, the three characters in. What does that tell you about the landscape around you? Is that the, is that ditch that they're in? Is that the border between one farm and another, between prosperity and maybe not so much prosperity? Uh, things are growing. Things are maybe happy. Things are maybe sad. So I think this is this is one of the things that that uh, the artist is trying to uh, trying to tell you or get you to maybe to think about. Uh, I think one of the uh, the things that the artist uh, Kenneth Adams is trying to tell us is that the. Uh, the American West, everybody used to think it's an, uh, just a big wilderness and just empty spaces as far as the eye can see. Well, yeah, there are some shapes. The mountains give you shape, the buildings give shape, the trees and the vegetation give shape. So it's just not an empty, forlorn wilderness. And of course, there are parts that are like that because of the, the arid and uh, lack of rain. but. You've, you've got real shape to the, uh, to the American West, as you'll see in, in some of the, the next one or two paintings that we're going we're gonna to talk about. Okay, again, just to ask you, kind of review what you see is something maybe different than what I've seen and what I'm talking about. Uh, some of the, the students that come in here and they look at this before they start their tour, they, they come up with questions that perhaps some of us do not see, have not seen. So that's something to think about as you look at all paintings, there's their stories. And uh, it's, it's there for you to, to, to paint your own picture and tell your, tell your own story. So, if you haven't come up with a name of it by this time, or maybe you've, came up, you've come up with a name that you like better, but this is called the Dry Ditch. And it's kind of obvious, as, as you hear it, the, the ditch that runs under the feet of the family as they stand there. And the colors are quite, uh, quite vivid. Uh, there's some reds and browns, and as you get in closer to it, you get a more of an experience of how deep that ditch is. And it's kind of the elephant in the room where it's very arid. The farmer has his rubber boots on hoping for rain. And hopefully he'll, he'll get that rain. But that's your story to make up. Thank you. Hi everybody, it's on to even hour again and we have moved to the dry ditch. Uh, by Henry Adams to another painting that I'm particularly fond of and a painting that a lot of our students come in here can pick up some of the style all, almost automatically. So I'd like to uh, share some of the information about the painting and some of the uh, things I'd like you to think about as you look at, at this painting. Again, all the artists are telling a story uh, or try to, and it's up to the viewer to maybe see what that, that story is and to make, kind of make their own picture in their mind about what's going on in the, in the picture. Uh, the artist is Walter Eufer, and Walter is an American artist born in Germany, and he came to the United States and decided to make Louisville, Kentucky his home. Uh, he was also, as Henry Adams, was trained as a lithographer. And as I mentioned before in the Adams piece, uh, many of the artists, the, uh, the paint and canvas artists, started off as lithographers or illustrators for magazines and newspapers as a way to earn money and to kind of get their foot in the door of the artist, uh, the artist's colonies and, and to work on their, have some money to work on their craft uh, as they progress. Uh, the, the name of this, this particular uh, painting is Going to the Waterhole. And it's, again, uh, as a lot of Western Native American art, it takes place in the Southwest. Again, this could be in Arizona or New Mexico. 
uh, Southern California, parts of Texas, and uh, any place that you want to imagine. As you, as you look at the painting, and again, every time I look at the painting, I see something a little bit different. You see five women that have water jugs on their heads. Now, I was kind of asked the question of why didn't they get a little closer and build their village closer to the water? Well, it may have been impossible. These, these folks may have been nomadic and they just go from place to place and the, they use the water where they find it. Uh, the water is carried in jugs on their head. Now, are they going with water in the jugs? Are they going to get water? What, what's kind of, what's the story behind it? Uh, there, there, are five, there are five women and the landscape is a little bit different than what we saw in the Henry Adams piece. The landscape is, looks to be pretty rocky and rugged. You see some mountains in the back and you see some, some green, some sagebrush or such going and the women are coming this direction. It's hard to tell, I can't anyway, to tell if these women are, are carrying a, a heavy burden or they're, they just started to go to take their burden. Uh, one of the extraordinary parts of this uh, particular painting is the dots in the background that depict the, 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 the sky and splashes of white. This is, uh, and this is what the kids nail almost every time, this is pointillism. And the, the, uh, the practice of pointillism is really in sharp contrast to the, the brush strokes that you see below on the rocks and this, uh, the sagebrush and the, uh, the mountains in the background. The, the strokes uh, on the rock formations here are, pretty, are broad and kind of sweeping and you look up in the sky and the sky is made up of dots of pink and blue and white in some places. And again, this is called pointillism. And just to bring it kind of into a perspective for a lot of you, televisions and computer monitors use a similar technique to represent image colors using red, green, and blue. And an artist will take his brush and just dot, dot, dot all over, all over the place. Um, I believe George Seurat was one of the early proponents of pointillism and did a number of his pieces uh, in, in the pointillistic style. Also, uh, Walter Eufert, when he painted, he used a technique of what they call alta prima, or wet on wet technique. This was a pretty much a direct and unpredictable way to paint. He just, he, there was no way to go back. When he painted, it was wet on top of wet on top of wet and he didn't allow any to, to dry so as he painted so this uh, this was something that when you started it was hard to hard to go back on he he uh, Walter Prima requires a, the artist to paint quickly often creating a finished work in a single setting painting from top, top to bottom rarely making any changes so this was a, a technique that uh, Mr. Eufer uh, used. He was also a member of the Tao Society of Artists and one of the first Tao artists to win the Carnegie International Prize. He had other, uh, other uh, recognitions as part of his, his career. Mr. Eufer painted Native Americans and other Western figures as they were, not as they were st stylized, stereotypical. He painted them during their activities of daily living, their, their working, their recreation, and the areas that they lived in. One of the, one of the other things I like to, to bring out as you look at this painting again, the contrast with the colors, the sky and the ground, and, and the, the the ladies who are carrying the water, but you have a, it's probably a, a steer skull or a buffalo skull kind of uh, offsetting the, 
the picture, the foreground of the picture. Uh, this kind of stylizes the, or uh, brings to focus the aridness of the country, the fact that not all the animals and all the people who went out there lived to tell the, tell the story after. It was a harsh land and it took, it took some, some uh, activity to, to survive in, in that land. Hello everyone, it's Don Bevenauer again, and I would like to share with you uh, one of the more striking and outstanding pieces that we have at the Alleyward. And this is more of a contemporary nature. Mr. Bernard Williams uh, painted this in 1960, 1995, and Mr. Williams was born in 1964. So he's a little, little younger, and uh, he goes back in history and takes a character by the name of Bill Pickett. Now, Bill Pickett was a notable African-American cowboy, and he chose Mr. Pickett because Mr. Pickett really has a story to tell as a cowboy and a individual who had uh, an African-American parent, an African-American, Native American parent, and sort of epitomizes the American West and lets us know that the, the cowboys were not all white. Bill Pickett was a famed Oklahoma rodeo champion and the picture is an acknowledgement of the multiracial story of the cowboy. Uh, he, as I mentioned before, he grew up with uh, parents of African American and Native American heritage. And, and early on, he spent uh, his youth uh, trick riding and uh, working as a cowboy until he joined the rodeo. Uh, Mr. Pickett was probably best known as a steer wrestler, and he pretty much invented the sport of steer wrestling in the rodeo circuit. Now, when Mr. Pickett, when he would ride up his horse, jump right on his horse, jump off the, jump off the horse and onto the, the bull or the steer that he was gonna wrestle, grab the, the steer by the horns, and turned him over and bit his lip, bit the steer's lip, and wrestled him to the ground. And this became the sport of steer wrestling in the early or late, uh, or the late 1890s, 1900s or so. So Mr. Pickett was, was credited with starting the sport, which you could see in, in American rodeos today, but not with the biting of the lower lip. But, uh, Mr. Pickett also traveled with the Wild West Show and was uh, pretty famous for his exploits uh, as a cowboy and as a, uh, a character of the American West. Pickett performed until about 1916 working as a cowhand and a rancher thereafter. He later appeared in two silent films the Bulldogger in 1921, and the Crimson Skull in 1922, and I saw clips of the Crimson Skull from 1922. It's, it's not a, it's a silent film, so it's a whole different genre from what we're used to, to working at, but it's, it's fun to watch the, the different ways that the, the, the cinema uh, uh, genre has evolved over the years. So he, not only was he a rodeo champion, but he was a, he was a screen idol as well. One of the things that you, when you look at the picture of Mr. Pickett, uh, you notice the broad brush strokes. And when some of the kids have come in, they call it gloppy brushwork. And he, the artist, Mr. Williams, just paints broad sweeping strokes using a multitude of color and a multitude of shapes and you almost want to go out and touch it because it's, it's one of those pieces I think that if you don't put your hands in your pockets, 
it's really going to be tough not to not, not to touch it. As you walk up to what you see, Mr. Pickett's big white teeth, they're just sort of greeting you. The, the tilt of his head is really a, a very positive and very uh, assertive and very uh, a happy individual and someone who is very uh, uh, self-assured. That's the word I was looking for, self-assured. And I guess you'd have to be that way if you were going to jump off a horse under the steer and wrestle him to the ground. But you can see in the painting, you've got a multitude of greens and oranges and uh, stripes, a little red stripe here. And down at the bottom right-hand corner of the piece, for those of you who've uh, read Cervantes, you see a sort of a stylized picture or a stylized painting of Don Quixote. And this might not be something you would think would be Don Quixote, but you might think up your own, your own uh, rendition of the, uh, of the, of the uh, little figure at the bottom right of the, of the, of the picture. I, I like his hat. His hat just kind of sweeps and gives uh, a pretty stark background to his face. Uh, again, it, it really, it really uh, dominates the gallery here with its color and its verve and the fact that we have a, not only a almost bigger than life African-American cowboy, but we have a African-American artist with a similar background from Mr. Pickett, and that would be Mr. Williams. Uh, not only does he have a, a painting here at the Idol George, but he also has a, oh, where does it say? Oh, okay. He has a, his art has been exhibited at the Smithsonian National Museum of American Indians in Washington, D.C. So uh, that's, uh, that's Mr. Uh, Williams's uh, background a little bit. He was, he's native of Chicago, and he studied uh, art in Maine and in the Chicago Institute, uh, in School for the Art Institute of Chicago. So uh, again, a contemporary artist uh, bringing to life a, a person who, who lived uh, in the early 1900s. Uh, unfortunately, Mr. Pickett, because of his work with, with uh, the rodeos and animals, he was uh, kicked in the head uh, by a horse and never recovered and died in 1932. But uh, if you Google his name, you will find a lot of good information about Mr. Pickett as well as the artist, uh, uh, Mr. Williams. So uh, again, you can spend a lot of time looking at this and just, just uh, uh, having a good time with the, with the picture. I think it, it kind of gives you an uplift and the colors are just fantastic. Uh, the, the brush strokes, again, are, are very bold and, and wide and it, it, puts his, it puts his face together very nicely, I think, so thank you.